I'm I'm very excited. I think we really there is a really crit critical need for uh, more female specific data, and um, I I know we we're still remote and and probably we wish we would uh, see each other in person, but uh, we are also getting relieved that um, maybe the pandemic is an end. We are getting vaccinated all around. And talking about this, I'm sure that you all have seen some of the headlines around the vaccine and, and the blood clots. And obviously the first thing to say is, you know, those risks are very low and the vaccine is still uh, protective against, um, so it still has a, a massive um, risk benefit um, balance that is towards the benefits. But what is intriguing is that we've noticed that most of the severe side effects have been affecting women. And this was especially striking for the Jensen and Jensen vaccine, where uh, really almost all of the cases at the start were um, for women in the age between 18 and 48. And um, so this um, also in, in, my, in my social media, I brought a lot of uh, infographics like this, uh, trying to ponder the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of having a blood clot from even just oral contraceptives. And um, and so all of these numbers, you know, like so some of these infographics have been criticized because they don't exactly compare the same type of blood blood clot and and things like that. But um, it it triggers like some questions, right? Like even the simple question of like, could these blood clots that have been observed in women after they receive the COVID vaccine could be due to something else than the vaccine, for example? to the fact that were that they were on hormonal uh, therapies, for example, contraceptives, or simply because they were women, because in outside of the vaccine world, um, similar blood clots and similar uh, effects are more frequently observed in women than in men. And, and we still don't understand really what is it. And so what is the causal contribution of each of these factors for these side effects? And uh, there is still a lot to understand and a lot to impact, but we are also missing critical data on the reproductive status of these women. And typically we don't know whether, you know, uh, when the studies uh, for COVID are, are, are run, they of course they ask the sex and that's good, but they don't necessarily ask more about contraceptive use, about reproductive status, about um, a lot of things that are even the last menstrual, last menstrual cycle a period that can have an impact on the immune system, right? So there is no data that's collected, um, nor in the trial, nor in the continuous surveillance that we're just like all part of right now. And so we are missing on a really large scale opportunity to start and understand a little bit better how the reproductive system and the immune system are interacting in females. And in 2015, um, the NIH did a great effort in the bio for the biomedical research by requiring um, anyone who applied for grants to um, uh, include sex as a biological variable. And this was in 2015. So you can see now on the NIH, uh, the, the, the funding uh, in the US, this is now a requirement and you know, it has been followed in, in a lot of different countries and, and funding mechanisms. And you know, um, it, it has been, very beneficial and the reason is that uh, and and this has been very nicely introduced early this morning in the in the in the opening remarks is that a lot of studies were just done on men or even in animal studies it was like scientists were only using male rats or, or male mouse and the reason why they did that is because um you know there was one dimension less to deal with which was the reproductive uh, nature the cycling nature or the, the reproductive changes in animals. And um, it turns out that actually, you know, like not only mice go through changes uh, due to their reproductive status, but also actually uh, human females, right? And I actually would like to recommend this excellent review by Dr. Alvering, who is actually going to be on a panel tomorrow um, afternoon at this uh, summit. And she wrote like one of my favorite piece of literature, which is a review on is uh, female health cyclical evolutionary perspectives on menstruation and reviews all the evidence that we have that shows all the links between the immune system and the um, uh, reproductive health, like the, the cycling 
of female. And it takes some evolutionary perspective because that's the background of, of the I was wearing, but it also, um, you know, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. And so it's very interesting to see uh, all this going together. And especially this, this figure is, is very nice because it shows what uh, times in the cycle inflammation is increased and uh, decreased. And, you know, this is obviously something that's simplified to and reflects more likely like general inflammation, but we can also see uh, local inflammation events in different parts of the body that will fluctuate uh, with the menstrual cycle at different phase. And one way that um, this manifests is that uh, the, um, the symptoms of some of the chronic disease that are experienced by both female and males show cyclical occurrence or uh, severe aggravation and severity. Um, and this this is just showing the whole like female cycling life's history was including, you know, from birth, we have the menarche and then all the reproductive cycles, but potentially some pregnancy and breastfeeding who also have their impact on the immune um, system. So collecting female specific data through existing technologies, but also designing new technologies, and we'll, he we'll hear more about it in this panel, that specifically collect the female data will help on two fronts. One is to improve women health in general. And there I'm talking about anything that's strictly <laughs> um, female, right? Like pregnancy outcomes, reproductive disorders, such as PCOS, endometriosis, breast cancer outcomes, uh, understanding recurrent pregnancy losses, understanding fertility issues. But it will also really improve our understanding of the impact of the female cycling nature on conditions that exist in both sex, both sexes. And there we're talking about a bunch of chronic conditions and disease. Um, autoimmune diseases are especially important in that field. We are talking about depression and mental health, right? So uh, before puberty, boys and girls have equal chances of having depression, but then as soon as puberty hits, then female become a lot more likely. And this comes back to a more equal distribution after uh, menopause. And then we also talked this morning about differences in heart disease and, and, and a lot of things like that. And and uh, on depression and mental health, in the previous panel, we had um, something about um, uh, the postpartum uh, depression and research shows that there are also links to what is called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is this very heavy uh, form of PMS and which really we still don't really understand. It's, you know, at the boundary between like it's, it's all of these symptoms can be experienced by any sex, but then um, in female, we have this cycling uh, occurrence of aggravation of these symptoms. So um, yeah, so having data and collecting more data will help on these two fronts. So when I started my postdoc, I was looking for <laughs> female specific data. I was really interested in, in finding data, finding more data on the menstrual cycle and and especially um, naturally occurring menstrual cycles. And so I turned to um, what probably a lot of you know very well, those menstrual cycle tracking apps, right? Like you, you may be using one of these or you may heard of them or you're using a different one, uh, but really nowadays millions of females around the world are collecting data about themselves and generating like really large data set. And when I discovered this data and what I'm gonna show on the next slide is our time series from women who have been uh, tracking on more specifically fertility awareness um, tracking apps. And I was amazed how rich these data were. And just to show you an example, so this these are two time series from two users of two different apps. So in the top, we have one specific user of the Kindera app which is based in the US. And at the bottom, we have a user from the Simta app, which is in Switzerland and uh, based in Switzerland. And what we see is that these, women, these two women have been tracking almost every day, one for three years and one for seven years. And when we start seeing the richness of these data, we start to really appreciate the cyclic nature of female health and how like we have this rhythm and it's like really punctuating. And we can see interruptions in the menstrual cycles for pregnancies and we can see interruptions for breastfeeding and we see a, ret a return to the menses that's uh, not exactly as regular as it was before at first but then comes back to the previous uh, rhythm. 
and um so you know we 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 see very well like the temperature is going up and down with each cycle and we can very well contrast this situation where we have someone apparently healthy who has been ovulating very regularly and having menstrual cycle very regularly with on the top a time series of a user who is experiencing heavy bleeding who is experiencing uh almost no ovulation maybe one at nine months here and then it it starts like coming back uh, later, we know this person is not pregnant and we see the temperature is very low. So potentially this person is subfertile for several years before um, maybe having menstrual cycles coming back. And so um, these data are, are really rich and they provide a lot about the reproductive status, the context in which uh, women maybe are going like under treatment or maybe have some specific conditions and it really provides a background for this so we can we can see that already we can have this data we we did um some work to show that the data is actually quite accurate even though it's you know low tech most women use just uh, thermometers at home and observe their mucus and um uh lug their bleeding but it is useful. We can we can find that you know the the distribution of ovulation days um, match what is expected uh, from the medical literature. So it's it, it's pretty interesting to have uh, these data. We also uh, developed a method so that we can label those time series and really learn from these time series and understand how many people go through pregnancy losses and recurrent pregnancy losses in these massive data sets. So um that's that's like really encouraging to see that low deck and cheap deck really can uh give us an affordable way to include reproductive status in any longitudinal study and go beyond just sex as a biological variable but having um the reproductive status as the context in which anyone enters a study and what does it change to have more precise data and a better understanding of the menstrual cycle? So I just showed you like, okay, already with some tech that is around, we can do this and we can, I'm sure we can do this even better with other tech that will be introduced on the panel today. But what does it change to have more precise data and to have a better understanding of the menstrual cycle? Well, I started to recently work with um, a team, um, a large consortium on the vaginal microbiome and I just wanted to show this paper, like I consider it as a landmark paper and it's, it's, it's an amazing paper, like the data collected is very rich. It's on the vaginal microbiome and this is showing the temporal dynamics of the human vaginal microbiota in 32 subjects. I think they sequenced uh, their, their microbiota daily for 16 weeks of so very, very rich data. And as you can see, everyone has a different <laughs> microbiota and there are changes around the menses. And at some point in the paper, they uh, said that they wanted to study how it changed with the menstrual cycle. And what they did is that they normalized menstrual cycles. And, and when I read that, I, I had to, to reread that again. What do you mean normalize and how did you do that? And they simply squished or elongated menstrual cycles. And this is like literally in your, ignoring the whole literature that has haven't been published on the menstrual cycle phase distribution. Because we know that the second part of the menstrual cycle is a lot more consistent in duration than the follicular phase. So if you want to squish anything, um, then at least just do it on the first part, like don't do it on the second part, because you know that otherwise, otherwise everyone is going to not have the main event of the menstrual cycle, which is ovulation aligned. And so their conclusion from, from this and from doing this analysis that, oh, they couldn't really find something very associated with the menstrual cycle. Um, and also what surprised me is that even though they have this extremely rich data set, they didn't really bother measuring hormonal levels. And like, I really, I really like this, this, this study. I don't want to, I don't want to say anything so bad, but I, I was really surprised that if you go invest the money to collect these very rich data set, you don't even ask the, your participants to take ovulation tests. Right. So it was really hard to uh, adjust ovulation and what it turns out is that when I uh, took similar data and instead of doing this weird normalization, you actually align or you try to align with the data you have, uh, the menstrual cycles together and the ovulations together, then you start to see that all of your subjects, except 
this one here has a very, very high correlation in their microbiota changes between two consecutive cycles. And so once you start actually taking the reproductive nature and you incorporate it in, in a way that makes sense with what we know about the biology, then you start seeing a very strong signal. And uh, so that's just, um, yeah, I just wanted to show this. This is preliminary, preliminary work, but I wanted to take those few examples and these few visuals to really introduce introduce this panel and really say that we still have a whole new work to discover and to understand. And for this, we need to collect more and better female specific data. And we need to develop also technologies to collect this data. We need to develop softwares to analyze this data. And we also need to improve education on the cyclic nature of women's health. It has to become the norm that every expert of every medical discipline should know which variable might be relevant for their study and how to incorporate this data in their analysis. So that really the future of medical research is fully including uh, females into the equations. And so with this, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. So We'll have Marina Pavlovich Rivas, who is the CEO and co-founder of Eli Health. Uh, we'll have Eric D, who is a co-founder and CEO of Bloom Life. And I believe Sarah Karish, I didn't see her backstage, but maybe she came up um, right now, I can't see, uh, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of Karen Medical. Um, and I will just stop sharing my screen so I can go back to uh, you guys. All right. Oh yeah, and I see Sarah is here with us, so that's great. Um, and so I think it is uh, now time then to introduce um, Marina Pavlovich Rivas with a little more detail as she's going to give us our first presentation. So she's the co-founder and CEO of Eli Health. The company develops an at-home device that can capture daily hormone fluctuations from saliva and an app that provides insights tailored to each user's unique profile. So hormones are at the core of hormone reproductive and general health, and yet they remain a black box. Um, Eli Health unlocks this box and put women's daily hormonal data in women's health. The company develops an at-home device that captures the hormones in saliva and uh, the app, as I said, so that they can uh, take better decisions on their hormonal therapies or, or, or the health in general and decide on intervention with this data at hand. Um, so with this, Marina, um, I think you can share your screen and your presentation with us. Thanks a lot, uh, Laura. I don't have a um, uh, PowerPoint, but I'll give a view of the company and thank you so much for the the presentation on, well, the impact of data on women's health that's directly related to what we're doing at uh, LE. To give you a short uh, overview, we started the company in 2019, initially around contraception, because we were seeing a lot of women around us looking for a method that is hormone-free, non-invasive, but still effective. And by talking to uh, physicians, looking at the existing research, uh, scientific literature, we saw that hormone monitoring could be a viable path. I think you'll hear, uh, hear more about that uh, tomorrow in a panel dedicated to uh, contraception and fertility. Um, but very quickly, we realized that once we are able to measure uh, hormones in a way that's adapted for high frequency and long-term testing, that the impact goes much beyond contraception and fertility because by putting uh, hormonal data in women's health, it can help us, well, first of all, understand our body better, take control of our health at every stages of our life, but also have a better understanding of uh, women's health in ways that you mentioned, uh, Laura, uh, earlier. So that's really wh what we're all about. Uh, putting uh, hormonal data in women's health, women's hand with a device that um, you can use at home. So a small device that measures hormones in saliva and that is really designed for uh, long-term and high frequency uh, testing. Thank you so much, um, Marina. And um, 
So I'll, I'll move to our next panelist, who's Eric D. Um, so who, uh, Eric D is a PhD, is co-founder of NCO of Bloom, Bloom Life, which is a women health company designing remote prenatal care solutions to improve the health of women and babies. Um, so Eric brings this unique perspective on the opportunities and challenges in emerging healthcare technologies and delivery models. This is informed by multidisciplinary technical expertise, leading business development for Europe's leading R&D Institute, IMEC. Um, Eric, if I have this information properly, you earned your Bachelor in Bioengineering from Cornell and then your Master and PhD in Biomedical Engineering from UCLA. And uh, Bloom Life, uh, your company has been recognized for the pioneering work, winning Fast Company World Changing Ideas, the Johnson & Johnson Quick Fire Challenge, the Richard Branson Extreme Tech Challenge, MedTech Innovator Award, and you have been uh, speaking at the White House Precision Public Health Summit. So very happy to have you. And I'm not sure if you have slides or if you're- uh, I do, I do. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be right. here with you all on this topic. Uh, and, and, uh, and my hat's off to Oriana and the rest of the team for, um, for hosting this event and throwing it. It's, uh, uh, there was not many women's health dedicated events when we started this company uh, back in 20, 2015. And so it's been great to see more dedicated events really focused on this important topic. So I do have a few slides. Let me see if I could- uh, if I'm able to share them. Uh, oh, all right, hold on. I think I may need to change something here. Of course, settings, see if that works. Uh, I do have slides, but I think I have to quit and reopen. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll skip the slides and just talk about talk about the company. Um, so Bloom Life, we're a, we're a clinical stage women's health company uh, developing technologies and services to improve um, birth outcomes. And we do so, do so as Laura mentioned, through um, development of remote prenatal care solutions and um, um, development of digital biomarkers that come through the data we're able to collect um, through these kind of solutions. And so to give everyone a little bit of background, um, and this is kind of a very US kind of centric view on sort of the state of maternal health right now, um, it's not good. Um, in the US um, over the past several decades and actually even globally, there's been an increasing rate of high risk pregnancies and pregnancy complications um, between 2014 and 2018 alone. Um, High-risk pregnancies increased by 31%, according to the Blue Cross Blue Shield. And if you have some sort of pregnancy complication, that doubles your chance of having some sort of childbirth complication. And so these high-risk pregnancies, which ultimately account for somewhere between 12 to 15% of pregnancies, are ultimately driving about 60% of the $110 billion a year we spent on pregnancy and childbirth in the U.S. Um, and not only does it have this immediate impact on sort of these birth outcomes, if you take a slightly wider lens, Pregnancy complications significantly increase later uh, chances of developing some sort of um, chronic disease later in life. And that could be cardiovascular disease, a type 2 diabetes. I mean, there's a 10 times likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes if you've had gestational diabetes. And so there's some pretty significant problems that we face in the U.S. Um, and at the same time as there's all these increased pregnancy complications that require a lot more care, um, there's also a shortage of care providers. And so about women living in about 50% of the U.S. effectively live in what's considered maternity care deserts. And so these are areas of the U.S. that have no obstetric care providers, no OBGYNs, uh, no midwives. And so they often have to travel very far distances just to get basic prenatal care. And so while all this is happening, of course, the way that we deliver prenatal care fundamentally hasn't changed. I mean, it's still centered around these spot checks at the doctor's office using really old antiquated technology, a quick conversation with the doctor and the mom's out the door. And there are some really major gaps right now um, in the data that moms and doctors have available to them that's really impacting clinical decision making. Um, and the best example I like to use for this um, is, um, is actually something that happens during uh, labor and delivery. Um, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's the, one of the major drivers of unnecessary C-sections. And so in the US, um, C-section rates are about 30, 31, 32%. Um, and according to the World Health Organization, those should be probably about 15 percent. Um, and uh, researchers have looked at what are the underlying reasons for doctors having these unnecessary C-sections. And the number one reason is um, what they clinically call labor dystocia, which essentially um, is the women's not sort of progressing as, as, as quickly as, that, as what they would expect during the labor process. Um, and so that's the number one reason for C-sections. And so, of course, that begs the question, well, how do they know what normal labor progression looks like? How do they figure this out? And so um, for the past 60 plus years, um, they've used what's called the Friedman curve, 
which is essentially a curve that looks at how quickly the various stages of labor progress to determine what normal labor progression looks like. So of course, where did the Freeman curve come from? And so actually it came from a study in 1955. It was a single site study it took place at the University of Columbia, observational study, first time moms with 500 Caucasian women. And that's what they defined to be normal labor progression. And to make this worse, 55% of those women had delivery by forceps and even worse because this was taking place in the fifties and sort of this is what standard of care was. 96% of the women that were part of the study were sedated, some significantly sedated. And so they essentially have extrapolated from a 500 person observational study at one location with 500 white women that were predominantly sedated, that this is what normal labor progression looks like. And this is a significant problem as you can all imagine. And so part of what we're developing at Bloom Life is um, not just the technology to improve clinical care today by improving access, um, you know, empowering moms to take a more active role and aggregating data help doctors to make better decisions today. Ultimately, what we aim to do is aggregate the largest physiological data set in the world on pregnancy longitudinally across tens of thousands of pregnancies with real world outcomes and to take this data to see how can we actually use this to better understand, um, better stratify risk, um, be able to tailor care to more effectively address modifiable risk factors and be able to develop digital biomarkers to better understand and predict potentially adverse events. Um, and what we've done today, and of course, if you see my slides, you can see all these things. Um, what we've done today is we've already aggregated data from about 12,000 women throughout the US. 30% um, were high risk pregnancies, 45% came from rural communities, um, multi ethnic mix. Um, and it essentially has allowed us to aggregate about 1 million hours of longitudinal physiological data. Um, in some circles, this is probably not that big. In the, in the women's health and maternal health space, it's, it's huge. Uh, the next largest data set we could find out there had about 500 hours and took six years to collect. And so I think it speaks to the power of using these technologies that could go into the home to get more regular data samples um, as Marina's company is also doing. And what we've done with this data to date is to actually do a first, um, a first pass of machine learning against this data set and have developed a digital biomarker to identify labor onset so this was trained with data we collected in the real world sort of environment. And we then ran a prospective study that was funded by the European Commission to see, can we can this data in a, in a sort of more prospective manner be able to distinguish between labor and non-labor? And we we're essentially able to show that we could identify labor onset with the same accuracy as a doctor giving a, a physical exam. So it's a pretty significant um, finding. And the implications from a clinical lens is being able to reduce unnecessary trips to the hospital for false labor, which occur in about one in three pregnancies, um, be able to uh, get a better idea of what normal labor staging looks like, again, to potentially address some of the C-sections, and also, uh, and perhaps mo most importantly, as it relates to sort of global health outcomes, be able to earlier identify spontaneous preterm labor with the goal of intervening earlier to, um, predict, to prevent or at least delay preterm birth, which is a massive, 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 massive global issue in um, the maternal health space. So. That's what we're working on. I'm sure we'll dive into more details uh, later, but it's uh, great to be with you all. Thank you. For this introduction um, and for also putting in context uh, what is indeed the status of Marina Health in the US, but not just in the US. Um, um, and so moving on to our um, last panelist, uh, Sarah Karish, and hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, so. Before moving back to London, Sarah lived in the Silicon Valley. Hello. <laughs> um, and for 15 years where she worked on, with some of the great inventors of our, age, of our age. This included senior marketing and strategy roles at General Magic, Me Please, and Antidote. As a filmmaker, her productions have been distributed worldwide and won many awards, including a Peabody and an Emmy nomination. In 2017, she made a short film about the last few days of the tech team at the White House under President Obama. Sarah is currently Chief Strategy Officer at Karen Medical, working with an incredibly talented deep learning team to improve the detection and treatment of breast cancer. And with this, I'm very happy to leave you the floor and introduce yourself and the company. Thank you. Very nice to be with you today. And I'm just thrilled to hear about these solutions. I think, you know, just the black box of hormones, it's, as you said, it's such a mystery that we know nothing about. And yet women are being prescribed treatments without that underlying um, data. It's so important and also maternal health. It's just amazing to be with you today. 
Um, so yes, I work at a company called Chiron Medical, and our mission is to give every woman a better fighting chance against breast cancer through more accurate diagnosis. And we do that through AI. And one of the, the sort of really important topics on AI is how you train it, how you generalize it, and how you make it inclusive. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a specific product we've developed, because I think I can touch upon some of these important points um, by referencing our initial product, which is called Mia. Let's see if I can do this. You guys see my screen? Did the presentation come up? No? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about Mia, which is one of our first products. And Mia essentially acts as a radiologist in the breast screening workflow. It can make the decision, the same decision that a radiologist can, should this woman be called back for further assessment. And the gold standard of breast screening in Europe is that two, uh, breast cancer detection is so difficult that two radiologists or readers are required to read each mammogram. So Mia isn't replacing radiologists, Mia is simply coming in as one of those second readers. Um, there's an acute need for AI solutions like Mia um, in breast screening particularly for several reasons. One is that there's a massive Workflow workforce crisis in terms of trained readers and radiologists in the breast screening space. Um, but that's been compounded by COVID. In the UK, there's 1.3 million women who haven't been screened as a result of COVID. And obviously, you can just uh, extrapolate that the, those numbers are enormous globally. Um, there's no way that we can catch up just from human resource alone. And really, solutions, tech solutions, and AI solutions like MIR um, are, are inevitable, I think, in terms of the future. So I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend and colleague, Mary Beth, who works on my team. Um, Mary Beth, um, she leads our partnerships worldwide. And last year, she was diagnosed um, with breast cancer. And Mary Beth was lucky in that her breast cancer was discovered really early. And she was treatment free in eight weeks. And I mention this because the importance of cancer detection can mean the difference between an outcome like Mary Beth's or the outcome of um, another advisor to us, Dr. Liz O'Riordan, whose breast cancer was discovered late. And for Liz, that's meant several rounds of chemotherapy. So what we're focusing and trying to do is develop a technology that's um, even more accurate in terms of the detection of cancer. Um, what's interesting, I think, is, is that what we're seeing is that radiologists and the technology see things differently, and we think that that sweet spot is in the middle, um, and that's what we're focusing on. So I've, I've highlighted and mentioned some of the challenges in breast screening programs, um, the workforce crisis being one, COVID exacerbating that crisis. Um, but there's quite a bit of variability in performance because breast cancer detection is so difficult. So 20% of all cancers are missed, for example, even in some of the best centers. Um, and you know that variable performance and missing cancers, that, that's a very significant number, 20%. There have been some solutions developed historically, but um, using old technologies. And so the new deep learning algorithms are much more powerful in terms of being able to perform these detection tasks. And as I said, we've been focused on, can we detect breast cancer earlier? Um, this is the decision that I mentioned earlier, the recall or no recall. Um, you'll see the image there where Mia says a callback is recommended. And, um, you know, this, we've just got lots of really interesting cases where Mia detects breast cancers that even experts miss. And you can see this here that on the left, Mia found a cancer um, that radiologists missed. Um, and, you know, we have several examples of that. And obviously, it's not enough um, to just show individual cases. When you're testing AI, you have to do it at scale. And um, so one of the things we've been focused on is developing the technology with leading academic institutes worldwide. And key to that is, you know, massive volumes of data, because when you're testing and evaluating AI, you have to make sure that it works for every woman. And that's not just a question of getting um, the right volume of data and the right kind of data. So making sure that it's from a screening population, but also making sure it's inclusive because breast tissue is very different depending on your ethnicity. So that, that inclusion piece has really been fundamental to our development. We've performed one of the largest clinical trials and studies ever done, because as you said, when you're dealing with AI, you have to do it at scale. And so um, the trial that we just, fit, we've done 
two trials now, and the second one was performed on over 250,000 cases. We think it's one of the largest AI trials ever done. Um, and the performance is at the level of expert radiologists and meets all the performance standards um, for the British Breast Screening Program as well. And this is the scale that I was talking about when you think about what kind of data you need to develop really robust and clinically safe algorithms that generalize. So multi-site, multi-hardware, women from different ethnicities, and then all kinds of other stratifications that we're looking at. And this sort of very rigorous, large-scale approach um, just won us the endorsement of the UK government. We won one of the first AI and healthcare awards. And what that means for us is this is enabling us to accelerate the deployment and adoption of MIR in the UK to 15 hospitals. And importantly, <clears throat> it's enabled really the first tests of whether MIR will generalize. So, it's, you know, it's not just enough to build an algorithm in a black box. Even if the data set is huge, you still need to make sure it's, it works on unseen data sets. We've done some really interesting evaluations recently that have proven that um, MIA is um, generalizing and we still have several safety gates to go. We need to make sure it works for every woman everywhere. So there's more work to be done, but very, very promising. And, you know, then fundamentally just coming back to that belief that <clears throat> we're not developing AI to replace humans. We're developing it to give them better tools. Um, and for women, uh, you know, the outcomes that were focused on are earlier cancer detection, better outcomes, fewer recalls, and then obviously there are also benefits for providers and radiologists. I think, you know, our founder, Peter Ketchkometi, um, essentially grew up in a radiology room, and, you know, he has that, his mom's a radiologist, and he used to go to her radiology screening center after school and famously used a CT machine before he could use a computer. Um, and I, but I think that sort of really granular understanding of not just, you know, we've talked about needing volumes of data and we've talked about using uh, women, uh, data from women from different ethnicities, but equally you need to be really close to the ground and look at in individual centers and doctors and patients, what are they experiencing? So doing that qualitative assessment is also really, really important, I think, for developing the kinds of products that will have the, the impact that we want to have. Um, and I think... Um, just on that note, I think, just going back again to this issue of inclusion and diversity, I think this should be the driver of everything we do. It's not just about female data, it's about making sure that that is representative and inclusive. And some of the work that I'm most proud of is the partnerships we've established with centers like UCSF and Emory. So Emory has a very large population of African-American women, for example. So um, I would just urge all of you developing products in this space just to make sure that we're not just thinking about the right scale of data, but we're also thinking about making it inclusive. Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully share uh, fully share this and I'm really grateful you, you brought it you brought it up. Um, so Thank you all for the introductions. Um, with this, um, I'm going to jump um, with the first question for all of you. And that is, you know, we're all like very future looking in, in this panel, but maybe to take a little bit of a step back. And if you could talk a little, like bring it, bring us back to the setup of what existed before this technology um, that you guys all developed was there. and why such technologies didn't exist already? Like, was it because really there was a lack of technical know-how? Was it a lack of funding? Was it a lack of people who were interested in, in you know, doing those companies like entrepreneurs in that field? So I would be curious to see where we were or maybe where we still are and what were the blocks and where you you found that crucial elements to move forward in your, in your different fields. Please go ahead. Um, <laughs> anyone who's inspired, I, it's a question for everyone. I can go ahead. Well, in hormonal tracking, a lot of the existing products are really ovulation centric, really around detecting the ovulation, detecting the ovulation peak, detecting LH um, uh, that we found um, before uh, ovulation, the temperature drop uh, still for ovulation, but really product that goes beyond that to to look at the role of hormonal hormones and general health or even women's health but beyond the reproductive uh phase um 
the, there's a, a big lack of those uh, products on the market at the moment. And one of the reasons why it's really a, a combination between the technological feasibility and culture, cultural shift that we've experienced in the past few years. Biotechnology has evolved a lot in the recent uh, years. And to be able to um, to be able to go beyond uh, fertility and uh, the ovulation, we need products that are easy to use, that are easy to integrate in the day to day, that are easy to use over a long period of time. So we can think of the glucometer, for example, to track glucose every day for a long period of time. It needs to be uh, easy and even easier than the glucometer where you need to take a, a blood, a, a small blood a sample. So to reach that in terms of technology, uh, it requires technologies that are able to go in very low levels of hormones that are able to measure more than one hormones and to do it in a way um, that's uh, easy for the user and easy for uh, long-term and high-frequency testing. So a few years ago, that was not technologically feasible. Uh, now it is. So that's for the technological part. And for the cultural part, um, women's health have uh, boomed, as you, as you, some of you mentioned before, Eric, you were mentioning that when you started your company, there was a few uh, events around women's health. That's not the, the case anymore. So there's an increased awareness around uh, women's health, around the gap that have happened uh, over the past few years in terms of uh, under-research, um, um, lack of research around women's health, lack of funding. Uh, and now people are realizing the gap and starting to, to adjust it. So it's that um, combination of those two factors that, uh, that make it now possible to, um, to have such a solution. jump in here um and i actually just realized I didn't really talk about what, what our product is so uh part of what uh we've developed is a is a wearable device it's um it's a patch that's worn on the belly and we non-invasively track physiological signals of maternal fetal health so it works very similar to like a cardiac monitoring patch and so what we pick up on is maternal ekg fetal EKG, maternal EHG, which is uterine activity. And from those sort of signals, you could derive a number of things such as fetal heart rate, fetal heart rate variability, contractions, uh, maternal stress based upon maternal heart rate variability. And so um, that connects to a smartphone app, data goes to the cloud, crunch data, general reports, push it to the doctor. Um, uh, to your question, Laura, over sort of what has existed for us, um, you know, predominantly everything that's existed to track pregnancies has been around um, technology that was developed in, the, I think it was the late 50s. It's a device called a cardiotocogram for anyone that's out there that's had a kid. It's the hockey pucks. They wrap around the mom's belly with essentially ace bandages, <laughs> which everyone hates. The moms hate it. The doctors hate it. The nurses hate it um, because they always fall off and they're uncomfortable. Um, so that's pretty much been standard of care for the longest time. Um, that technology isn't user friendly. Um, it's hard to sort of miniaturize. Um, um, and you know, I think to your question of, you know, why hasn't there been any change? I think there's, it's probably multifaceted. Um, part of it is um, a lack of investor interest, generally speaking, in the women's health space. Um, and so if there's no funding, then it's kind of hard to build products in this category. And for the folks that have kind of had the dominant position, um, there's kind of two companies, predominantly GE and Philips. They've pretty much been doing all inpatient monitoring. And when you have 80, 90% market share, there's not really a whole lot of push to innovate, right? Since you already have a captured customer. Um, so I think that's part of it. Part of it has been technology, but I don't think that's been the the sort of the, the primary sort of thing that's preventing it. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot that's changed over the past, you know, 15 to 20 years as it relates to um, sensors and, and low call sensors at that, that um, in many ways has been triggered by the, the smartphone industry that's really dropped the cost of developing um, new devices, um, you know, and, and, and so I think that has been a bit of a barrier, but I think that probably hasn't been one as, as big a one in the past probably 15 years or so. Um, and I think maybe the third barrier specifically in, um, in our domain is 
obstetricians are just pretty conservative people um, for, for good reasons. And so I think it's been um, more challenging for folks to really get products out there that, um, that identify exactly how this is intended to be beneficial to the, provi to the providers themselves. Um, you know, we're kind of taking a two phase approach of improving quality of care on the near term, um, which should be reimbursable under the current regimes with a medium to longer term view of actually improving upon standards with new solutions that are kind of a little more breakthrough from like a digital biomarker perspective. But it does take time to develop those data sets to, you know, to make useful tools out of them, to validate those tools, to get regulatory clearance, to put those into, into, into clinical workflow. So it's a long journey. And so I think it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to figure out how do you um, drive longer term innovation while still being able to fund the company over the near term, since most um, investors aren't interested in a 20 year journey with you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think that's, that's kind of what our perspective would be. I'm really glad you raised that, Eric, because that's definitely one of the biggest issues for small companies. It's just how do you stay long enough in the game when all of those hurdles have to be um, have to be overcome? Do you have a Do you have your product handy? I'd be really curious to see. I have the sensor. I don't, of course, I don't have the patch because I'm not prepared here. But so this is this is the sensor. So it's about the size of a match matchbox here, Amazing. and so this snaps into a disposable patch. It looks very much like a cardiac uh, patch. If anyone's seen like the eye rhythm patches, it kind of looks like that, only it's a different shape and it has electrodes integrated into this. And so, um, yeah, this is, but this is what the sensor is. This has two main chips as a, an analog front end for measuring electrical activity and then an accelerometer. Um, and then we just communicate to the phone via Bluetooth. That's amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so in addition to all of the other challenges that have been mentioned, I think really in our space, compute power, cloud have really enabled um, the development of AI. There were some earlier products developed, things like ICAD, um, and those products were largely based on supervised learning, so labeling, so having a bunch of radiologists label different things. And the result of that was a series of products that basically recalled way too many people and was very confusing and were generally not widely adopted. Um, Machine learning has come on and we're now in the sort of era of deep learning and, and the era of unsupervised learning when um, the AI is seeing things or perceiving things or what, whatever the right terminology is that um, humans perhaps can't see or that we can't know um, for sure. And I think that's it's a fascinating space but and raises a lot of questions in terms of what are, what is I mentioned earlier about um, the difference between the things that radiologists perceive and the AI will perceive in our case. But what we can do is we can start running some really interesting comparisons. So we did, we took um, a whole bunch of different kinds of characteristics of tumors in that massive trial I referred to. And we looked at, okay, what kinds of tumors were the radiologists picking up? What kind of tumors were me picking up? The astonishing thing, my expectation was that they would actually be really different. And in reality, they were very, very similar. So even though MIA um, functions um, largely in, in terms of unsupervised learning, we're still able to pick up the same number of invasive cancers and the same number of um, DCIS uh, lesions. So I think that I think that whole area is absolutely fascinating. And there's no on the space, but fundamentally, I think the challenge for AI solutions has been just the technology and the compute power. That was uh, very insightful. And following up uh, on this, and you were saying uh, just a moment ago that uh, previous tools would have like a much uh, uh, like a, a recall rate way too high, and so that wasn't really useful. And actually, um, one question I had for you was that um, you know the recommendations for the age at which women should have their first mammogram has actually heavily been determined by how many false positive and false negative were found that the French like was stratified by age and then basically setting setting a cutoff where uh, you know there would be not too many uh, false positive that would lead to you know heavy intervention and unnecessary intervention and then when the 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 prevalence of the of the disease was high enough that this would balance right each other and yes. so my question is do you anticipate or is this already the case that there are discussions with epidemiologists that a technology like MIA would allow to change those um, policies in terms of what's the age at which first mammogram should be taken by, by the 
by, by women. It certainly could, um, but I think going back to our earlier conversation, we'd have to do very large studies to make sure that that is in fact the case, which we haven't done yet because those, there are some very interesting trials happening where they're taking younger cohorts of women and old cohorts of women actually and looking at the efficacy of screening. So I think we have to then make sure that Mia was working on those populations to be able to have to, to be definitively say whether it could make a contribution in terms of tipping that balance or not. Um, I mean, obviously that would be our hope, um, but more work to be done. We'll follow up on that then. That's super interesting. Um, I, I had a, to continue a question for, and, and you kind of already started to answer that, uh, Eric, but what is, so the data you're collecting is, is basically a electrocardiogram or, or similar to that for women. I would, I was just curious if you can, could tell us a little bit about the type of data you were collecting, what's the sampling rate and, um, who is also seeing the data are the women like the, the, the future men seeing the data and, and maybe what are the limit, like the main limitations, like the hardest things that you guys had to overcome, maybe in terms of noise, in terms of accuracy mm -hmm. or some, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what we, uh, what we pick up is, um, electrophysiology. So we measure the electrical activity of the body and we specifically are interested in the mom's heart, the baby's heart and the uterus. Um, and to contrast that to the existing technology. So the existing technology for tracking pregnancies is, as I mentioned, this device called the cardiotocogram and it uses ultrasound to measure fetal heart rate. And then it uses a pressure probe on the abdomen to measure contractions by shifting from those technologies to our technologies, you actually capture a lot more information. There's a lot more information embedded in the electrical signals than there are in just sort of these kind of more rough signals. Essentially, it's the difference between like taking someone's pulse to measure their heart rate versus getting like an EKG. Like there's a lot more information, diagnostic information in EKG than if you just measure someone's pulse. The other things that we do is we're able to collect um, self-reported information from the mom through sort of qualitative surveys. Um, in the sort of the first phase of sort of the business we were in, um, we were also getting uh, self-reported due dates. So when did the mom actually deliver the baby, which sort of was the end point for our data set. Um, as we're sort of moving forward, we, we've kind of fully shifted into the healthcare medical domain. Um, and we'll start to get a lot more clinical data from the, from the medical side over other conditions that may have sort of popped up. So it's going to be a little bit more rich data on the clinical side. Um, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, to your question of who gets access to the data, uh, in the in the first phase, it was all the patient, all the moms who were sort of working directly with moms to kind of de-risk a lot of product experience and seeing how do we present information that becomes um, helpful for her to better understand what's going on and better communicate and more unfortunately have to advocate for herself in many ways to her her healthcare providers. Um, we are as we shift into the more medical domain. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a challenge right now with the FDA over what they feel comfortable with the woman having access to. Um, as a company, we fundamentally believe that women should have access to their information and that they we've already seen through, you know, the 14,000 plus women that have used the product that you can actually present information that is helpful for her. I think the FDA has concerns that people aren't going to know what to do with the data and they're going to they're gonna get worried and concerned and freak out. Um, and, and to be fair, it's not, I think, exclusively in maternal health that they have this concern. I think they have this concern, broadly speaking, in all areas of medicine. Um, I just fundamentally disagree with that. I think if you have people that are interested in knowing what's going on with their body, that presents such an incredibly great opportunity to increase health literacy, to help them take a better understanding of like how these various factors of their life are influencing their health. Um, so we, we continue to try to push the boundaries with the FDA to kind of like make sure we're getting information back in the hands of, of the patients. Um, some of the challenges, um, uh, you know, we we were measuring really hard physiological signals um, in a free living environment. Um, you know, our as 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 background, I mean, we we my our team has developed a lot of advanced wearable devices and brain monitoring and cardiac monitoring and sleep monitoring, like every kind of modality you can imagine. And I can safely say that uh, pregnancy is the hardest area, um, and for reasons that we didn't fully appreciate. Um, um, one of the ones in terms of like just measuring uh, contractions and, and trying to debug this in the field is um, in an antepartum setting, you don't know exactly when a woman's supposed to be contracting. Like she might be having no contractions. She might be having a lot of contractions because she's having Braxton Hicks. She might be having an irritable uterus. And so it's really hard. And, and women's perception of when she is contracting isn't always an, a reliable indicator. 
And so it was incredibly hard to try to debug and improve the algorithms out on the field to know, is this the algorithms? Is it something else that's going on? Is the mom sort of perception not accurate? Um, uh, so that was a challenging one. And on the fetal side, uh, we are trying to measure the only organ that moves. Like your heart is pretty much set in one spot. The baby is all over the place or on the left side and the right side, they're rolling around, the placenta is in the front, the placenta is in the back. And so the actual conditions uh, that you might be measuring can change from moment to moment, which presents a pretty big technical challenge that we've had to overcome. Um, and so we've come up with some pretty clever techniques to ensure data quality, um, uh, reliable signals, accurate signals. Since if you're going to be presenting any information to anyone, uh, especially in pregnancy, you need to really make sure it's accurate and reliable. Um, so there's been a number of, of challenges we've had to overcome that we, to, we feel like we're in a pretty good spot on. But it's, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's been interesting. Uh, to, to say the least. And I don't know if I covered, if I answered all your questions in there. I want to know if you also, yeah. sorry, I just wanted Go to ahead, know, Sarah. I wanted to know if you um, are also measuring how much the baby kicks and doing a longitudinal study about which ones become good soccer players. <laughs> so we, we, we have, we do measure fetal movement. So we, we are able to pick up on that. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, and, and but we're not necessarily having that long-term, long-term longitudinal study of looking at um, how this could imp uh, predict uh, uh, their, their football playing capabilities. Um, there really is some interesting uh, research that we're partnering up with some, some folks. Of the, and we were partnering up with um, a, a group in Singapore that's done this uh, study called the Gusto study that looked at maternal mental health uh, during pregnancy and how that is actually creating um, uh, uh, um, epigenetic changes in utero that are, and of course, this is the only kind of study would happen in Singapore where they're just kind of throwing monies at research. Uh, they essentially did um, uh, uh, brain imaging of the baby at birth and then every year until the age of seven. And they found that women that had high stress environments had babies that had um, um, underdeveloped uh, uh, parts of the brain for neuroregulation. And those persisted to the age of seven or eight that could lead to sort of behavioral problems later in life. And so then the question that we're working with them is like, well, how do we get more objective measurements of maternal stress during pregnancy? So there's some really, really some interesting things that um, that we could dig in on on this data. Um, and of course, where we have a particular data set, we're always interested in bringing in data from orthogonal things, whether or not that's blood-based things, urine-based things. We know we pull data from third-party devices like blood pressure cuffs. So there's a lot of really interesting things and, and we just have a facet of the solution that you need to kind of get all the other data points around it. Much. Um, uh, this was also interesting. I wanted to go back um, a little bit in the conversation so Marina about what is their vision for sharing the data with the patient going through medical, like the medical field? We, we just heard Eric saying at first they wanted to give all the data to the woman and then there's some discussion with the FDA. And then I wanted to know what was uh, your perspective for, for your company on, on, on this aspect, whether it's like a purely um, direct to customer service or if it's something that will uh, go through the medical world. So similarly to Eric, we believe as a company that data should be in women's hands, that data about our bodies, we should have access to it uh, to be able to take control of our own health. However, there's a responsible way to do it. And the that way is to really partner up with physicians, with regulatory bodies to make sure that the information we're sharing uh, is shared in a way that cannot cause harm. Um, but ultimately, the, the goal is really to put the data in women's health in partnership with, uh, with physicians and, and regulatory bodies because sometimes it's hard, it can be hard as a company to uh, predict all of the consequences of sharing that information. Uh, so there are regulation in place, there, there are medical um, professionals and partner, partnering up with them can enable to uh, avoid those uh, unforeseen uh, events. Uh, following up on that, so um, I, I know the primary goal is, is measuring hormonal levels and this is per se so important. Um, based on, on these hormonal levels, do you anticipate um, making any sort, some sort of diagnosis or suggestions or, you know, um, 
how does it, how does it work like this whole like diagnosis um how do you share this with with your customers and how how do they share this with their physicians and you know like what is the regulatory space around this and also what is just like like i, I think a lot of uh, medical students in the audience might be wondering as well you know like this is bringing a diagnosis to a patient you know is, is a big responsibility there you need to carefully pick your words you need to uh, you know say this at the right time and 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 then make sure you have solutions for them or you can discuss with them what are the next steps so i was wondering from your perspective how you saw this and if you're already thinking in those terms or, or not yet as you mentioned it's a big responsibility to to have and it's something we are in the future we want uh to be uh to be to go really beyond the reproductive phase and and be able to give actionable information to women and really understand what's happening, uh, we need to, to go beyond just giving the information, but also uh, give um, more context of, around what it means for, for women. Um, but to do that, um, it's, it's really a long process because we need to have the, the right clinical evidence uh, in place uh, doing the right clinical studies, uh, having the right uh, regulatory approvals, um, and working hand, hand to hand with, uh, with physicians. So it's definitely something that is on our roadmap, and that's ultimately our, our mission. But to get there, it's a, it's, a, it's a long process, and it has to be a long process because it comes with big, uh, big responsibilities. you and um maybe a question for um for all of you but um so so as you know I'm, I'm doing research and i'm always interested in hearing what are the if there are still like unanswered like questions in your field that your data could help and that's you know in partnerships with like i mean you you all have like talked about uh partnership with universities to you know make studies validate the products but maybe going a little bit beyond that, um, what are the questions that are still really open that we still really don't know about in you know, cancer research and, and maternal health or in just like reproductive hormones and health in general, like those intersection between reproductive hormones and you know, the immune system. Um, what, what do you see are unanswered questions? I think, if uh, any. But yeah, I mean, I think for us, the big question right now is the potential of AI and the kinds of technologies we're developing to predict breast cancer. And we just did um, a study in the States, uh, a very, um, a really interesting, um, it was but essentially, there were 25, it's a little bit hard to explain, but there were 25,000 women in this cohort, 5,000 of, of whom went on to develop breast cancer. It was a known outcome. And Mia was run against this sample. This is our technology. And it wasn't developed to be able to predict which of the women in that cohort would go on to protect breast cancer. Um, but astonishingly, it did with a very high level of accuracy. So of the 5,000, I don't remember the exact number, but it was an astonishing number that Mia picked up. So I think that's one of the, the, the surprise findings that whenever you're working at this scale, uh, when you start interrogating um, capacity and insight, um, I just think there's a, so much richness. Um, and, and I think we just have to retain curiosity to see like, well, could it, might it? And, and I think what, as a result of this, we've developed an entirely new product to basically address the COVID backlog and essentially have a lot of interest from sites who want to run, it's called RSVMP against um, their cohorts of women uh, looking at their last mammograms and of those women who should be prioritized for a callback. So I think that's an example of an unexpected finding and, and a really interesting area of, uh, for us research going forward. Thank you. Jump in. Um, uh, for us, uh, I, I think the, the biggest one is when are you going to go into labor? Um, there's a lot of things, um, both for uh, normal pregnancies, <laughs> that, that is a lot of curiosity around there. There's a lot of costs associated with kind of going in uh, uh, at the wrong time and, and clinical ends, 
preterm labor and preterm birth is the single biggest issue globally in women in, in maternal health. Um, 15 million babies are born preterm every year. 1 million die of preterm birth. It's the number one killer of children under the age of five. Um, and we have no idea um, when people are going to deliver preterm. And, and, and in fact, uh, I don't believe there's any tool, there's a few in development that actually can even predict who's going to deliver preterm. Um, today, it's at best a coin flip. Um, and the coin flip essentially is uh, when you get to a coin flip based uh, 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 predictive value, it's because you've had a prior preterm birth. And so the number one predictor of whether or not you will have a preterm birth is you've had a prior preterm birth. And so obviously for first time moms, that kind of leaves them out of that equation. Um, and then for those moms, it's at best a coin flip. And so um, um, coming up with data that allows you to earlier identify women that might be going into preterm labor, that are going to have a preterm birth. There's a lot of um, care coordination that could already be done to help support these uh, pregnancies. Um, and this isn't just in the US, this is a lot in the developing world as well, um, in making sure that uh, women get to the kind of care facilities that can support a preterm baby, since not all hospitals are equipped to support, um, or don't all have a NICU to be able to support a preterm birth. Um, but I think ultimately it goes, if you go further upstream, it's a matter of how do you actually better predict the moms that are going to deliver preterm and then intervene sooner to reduce the probability. And I think um, it's been challenging because preterm birth is a very complex disease with many etiologies. And so we're, we're kind of taking a very blunt force approach. And I think ultimately, it's I, I kind of view it the same thing as cancer. Like you're never going to prevent cancer, right? That's cancer is going to happen biologically. So it's just a question of how do you mitigate the effects of cancer? And I think preterm birth is the same thing. I don't think you're ever going to fully eliminate preterm births, but how do you mitigate the effects and perhaps lower the probability of a mom delivering preterm or at the very least delay when that preterm birth might happen since babies that are born after 32 weeks have a significantly higher uh, survival rate than those before born before 32 weeks. And so the more you can kind of let that baby gestate, um, the higher the chances of survival and, and, and less long-term impact. So I think there's a lot to be done over um, risk stratification, tailoring a care, and then um, having more uh, tools that are, as it gets closer to an impending birth or actually being able to identify, this mom's going into spontaneous preterm labor. She will go into spontaneous preterm labor in the next few days. Yeah, I, I, I'll just jump in, because uh, as, as I was saying in the introduction, um, you know, we, I started working on the microbiome and the microbiome has been associated with the preterm risk. But there is still this question that is like, not really answered it is like, what is the causality direction, right? Like, we don't really know if there is some signal that leads to, uh, you know, a, a dysbiosis in the vagina, or whether this dysbiosis could actually be uh, causing preterm. So super interesting there. And then I'll just um, then extend the mic to Marina so that uh, maybe she can tell us a little bit if there are any questions like um, research questions that they would be really interested to contribute helpful. Yes, well, there are many, as we, you were mentioning initially, uh, Laura, there's, we need to improve our understanding of women's health, but also the cyclical nature of women's health for condition that affects women uniquely, but some others that affect women uh, disproportionately or differently. And uh, the gaps in terms of research, uh, there's a lot of great research that has been done, but there's also many, many other areas that we need to dig deeper. And this is, um, it's a wide range. So for example, we had a researcher reach out to us uh, last month around epilepsy to, to, to try to predict epilepsy crisis uh, better based on the fluctuation of hormones. Uh, PMS, it's another uh, area of we feel symptoms every month, but why do we feel those symptoms uh, differently some months than, than other? Uh, being able to track the, the hormonal level could help to uh, unveil um, information there and improve our understanding uh, in, in many, many aspects of, of women's health because ultimately hormones are at the root of so many conditions and transition that we experience across their life, but we don't have that uh, data at the moment. So being able to have that data can could help improve uh, women's health outcome, but also our, our understanding uh, of it. Thank you. And I'll just add on this. Um, 
like when like one of the most um just like infuriating things honestly for me is when any woman goes to get a hormonal birth control um there is literally no baseline hormonal level that's ever taken and a lot of teenager girls get prescribed hormonal birth control to regulate the period which kind of is a nonsense but then really the fact that no hormonal like baseline is given and that you just go try in an error to see which birth control is going to work for you like to me this is like really crazy <laughs> uh, especially given all the side effects that can be associated with birth control so i just have one one note on that is my daughter um uh, had very irregular periods and um so same thing she was put on the pill and then she decided she really didn't want to be on the pill and had the same issue and then she went and had proper hormone profiling and proper blood profiling and it turns out she had a significant vitamin d deficiency and she took vitamin d and voila problem is solved and i think you know that it's again it's to that to your point not doing that fundamental underlying testing um is you know egregious to say the least and currently because of the last lack of understanding a lot of the treatments are about suppressing that um normal cycle instead of working with that cycle to understand what's happening and having uh, intervention that are uh, not trying to go against uh, the biology but really work with the the biology but for that we need to to have the right tools but also much more uh, research and having the the underlying underlying data as well and that's all about the the topic of the panel uh, today all right so we we are to open for questions from the audience soon but i would like to finish with um one um last kind of a general question so um i think there are lots of medical students in the audience with us today and you know some of it, some of them might be inspired by your products and so they might you know think of like going into that field or starting a fun tech adventure themselves and so what are your recommendations and also this is um, kind of related, but how, like we talked about the importance of, you know, being inclusive in terms of the data we collect, like making sure that it's not just a representative sample, but really that minorities are actually fully, uh, you know, are a full cohort. Um, but then on the dev team, like who should be on the, t like should be at the table, like who should be part of developing the product, who should be part of creating you know, the code, the software, the designing those products. And so a little bit on like the hiring, the challenges of going in that field or like, or recommendations in general for medical students with us today. So and just say that there's so many fundamental problems to be um, addressed for women. I and mean, we've just touched upon the richness of opportunity to make massive impact in women's lives today. Um, and you know, just even basic things like not hormone testing is super important and maternal health, but you know, basic things like uh, you know STD testing or um, other kinds of sort of basic testing that can be done and are starting to be done so beautifully by these home kits. So I think the field is ripe for innovation and, as I said, making massive impact on women's lives. Just on the inclusivity note. Um, you know, we're very, very focused on making sure that we're, I think, 45% women as a team. And in our tech team, we're 26% women. <clears throat> and obviously, we, we need to do more still, but Google, for example, is only 20%. So I think it's really, really important that you make sure that you have women as your, on, your, on your tech team, as your partners. Um, and, and we haven't talked about working with uh, women or patients, uh, depending on the condition, but that is fundamental. So often that very basic principle gets overlooked. So, uh, so my advice is, you know, if you have, um, if you really want to do something that makes a big impact in the world, this is an, an incredible space. Um, there are so many really important problems to be solved and also very important opportunities economically from a business development point of view. Um, but I think it all starts with listening to women. What do they need? Um, you know, what do they need in their daily life? I mean, literally just today I was thinking like, God, if I could just have something that would tell me what's going on with my hormones, because I think something's going on with my hormones. But I, you know, unless I can be, go on this, you know, go to the doctor and have the test and wait for the test and 
and then it's not even offered as a basic task. Um, so uh, anyway, that's that's it's as I said, it's um it's an opportunity to really change the lives of millions of people around the globe. Would have a live product for <laughs> for knowing what's going on with your hormones. <laughs> And I agree with uh, with Sarah that the the area is really ripe for innovation, and it's uh, for for students who, who are looking to combine their scientific knowledge uh, with uh, having an impact. It's a great area to do it, but also a great moment uh, to do it. And on the inclusivity note, I I believe it's critical to have a, a team that reflects the 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 users because historically minorities have been excluded for from some of those uh, developments and uh, the product that were uh, coming as a result of that development uh, was not always well suited for um, for women for minorities uh, so I I think we should not. Uh, redo the same uh, the same uh, mistake so I, I think it's critical to have a, a team that reflects the diversity of the the user base we are targeting uh, I would echo all those things um, I think Sarah or has already pointed out I'm sure their um, their stats of what their staff looks like isn't a consequence of of effort to try to find um, and recruit people within within sort of a, a diverse set or more women in the team. Sometimes it's hard. You need to kind of get sort of the best people for a role. And I think the the way that we found you could always augment that is, is make sure when you're doing user research to include people that um, don't look like you, right? Go into communities that you think actually can benefit um, and partner with, you know, we, we've done a fair amount of work in the underserved African-American community. Um, and while we don't have any African-American people on our team just yet, um, we have partnered with organizations to get us in front of those people to to kind of build those ties into and to make sure we're hearing from these moms and understanding what their own unique challenges are. Um, I, I think to the question over sort of, um, uh, you know, recommendations, um, uh, go after a big market. <laughs> I'm sure you're going after a big enough market because that's what investors are primarily looking for. Start to figure out early what your business model is, who's paying for your product. If you're going to have patients pay for it or consumers pay for it, that's one thing. If you want to go into healthcare, really understand how that's going to be paid for because a great idea often dies because there's no way of getting it paid for in healthcare. Um, and if you do need to get your own sort of codes to get reimbursed or whatnot, that could be an incredibly lengthy journey that oftentimes investors aren't interested in going on with you. Uh, so really understanding your business model early on and testing that is, is something that I think could really serve you well. Um, so just a few recommendations and I'm someone's buzzing my door. So I'm going to go let them in. Uh, so um, I will invite everyone uh, watching like with us today to um, if they have any questions to go on the top left uh, corner of the chat um, where they can ask questions and these will show up um, on our screen and, and we'll be able to to ask our people on our panel here so um, there are actually questions around this and i think I, I i mean i will ask this to everyone um so in each of your companies or product so who is the customer as you said is is it the 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 the, the mother the the woman or are, are, are these the physicians? And how do you access the reimbursement sphere? <laughs> so how do, you, how do you go concretely around this? Like, uh, how, like what are the concrete steps to go there? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, for us, when we started, we were working, uh, we, had a, uh, we were working directly with, with mom. So we were offering the product as sort of a direct to consumer sort of weekly subscription. Um, um, and so that was the, the only customer um, as in that it's, Going direct to consumer has its benefits of it's it's quick. You could kind of get to people directly. Um, you have direct access to your one of your primary end users. Um, the limitations, of course, are um, at least in the U.S., forty five percent of births are women on Medicaid, and so these are women that are going to typically be able to afford out of pocket. Um, we ultimately saw the big unlock for us is being able to get um, the product um, supported by healthcare providers and reimbursed by payers. 
And so we, we kind of have fully shifted into the medical domain. Um, and so for us now, uh, both the physician and the, and, the, and the mom are both customers. Um, the physician is required to order the product for the, for the patient, has to use the data to make clinical decisions, but the mom ultimately is the one who's using this in sort of her daily life. And so making sure that it fits for her, it's providing value for her um, is, is critical. Um, and then on the reimbursement question, that again, that's a, that's a much longer, lengthier, uh, trickier conversation. Um, there, do you, uh, how are similar products paid for today? Is there, are there codes associated with it? And granted, this also changes depending upon the part of the world you're living in. So if you're in Europe, it's very different than the US. Um, so are there codes associated with actually paying for these things today? Uh, how well are they paid for? What is the policies associated with when, they, when they're paid for, when they're not paid for? And if none of that stuff exists, then you either need to do a lot of studies to really um, demonstrate that a healthcare system or payer should actually cover these things, which can take years and years and years. Um, or you need to find a different way of creating value for someone that has an economic incentive of covering your product. So that's a very short answer to a, a longer question. Actually, I think you really summed up all the key challenges. For us, I think, you know, we sell into healthcare systems, so encounter some of the challenges Eric identified in the US. In, the, in Europe and the UK, it's, it's more straightforward. But ultimately, um, you know, for me, my, my vision is, is that um, women ask for me by name because they're so confident in its detection and accuracy. But I think that's how we change the game, by educating women about the options available to them. And I think that's honestly how we're going to change healthcare for women. And Marina, would you like to, yeah. Yeah, for, for us, it's a, a very similar path that we are uh, having than the one that Eric mentioned. We're going direct to consumer first because it's, uh, it's faster. But ultimately, our goal is really to partner up uh, with uh, payers and providers um, to, to help increase the affordability of the product and to to well to to help uh, women be able to to have the the product without uh, out of pocket uh, cost all right thank you um there was a question <laughs> um so how do you so first of all maybe to to everyone else um who i don't know who maybe has work also with uh gynecologists do you share the view that it's it's maybe a conservative um word I, I would I would tend to agree with this I, I was curious to hear from Marina and Sarah and then how do you um, how do you strive to inspire these maybe more conservative um, gynecologists and, and again there are reasons for why they're conservative but to use these new technologies Marina do you want to start or shall I go okay um, I think for us, you know, we've always viewed the clinician, in our case, radiologists, as um, and it's such a fundamental part of our journey. So what do they need? How we can help them? What are their daily stresses? So I would just say for us, um, yes, conservative, but, you know, they're responsible for patients' lives. That's an enormous responsibility. So I respect that. We respect that as a company. And I feel like our job is to um, work very closely with them, um, as I said, to understand their problems and also get the benefit of their insights about where we can really deliver value. And you know, I always just say to my team, uh, this is a long journey. Let's make sure we bring them along on the journey. How has been your experience so far? Uh, well, I think Sarah uh, summed it up very well that gynecologists are conservative for a, for a reason. Uh, they have to, they have that responsibility. When new technologies are being created, um, it's a long process from our side to create the clinical evidence, the clinical trials, to go to that regulatory process. Um, it's, um, it's a long path for startups but it's necessary. And that conservatism from the gynecologist and the, the space, it's necessary to, 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 to do things the, the right way. However, we've seen a lot of curiosity from 
um, from the medical uh, field because ultimately they they also know that there is gaps that there is still research that needs to be done and we've seen um, that curiosity of understanding how uh, new technologies including ours can can help fill some of those uh, some of those gaps in terms of understanding and how it could help uh, women's health outcomes uh, so like in any other fields there are some people that uh, like how things are done today that it's are harder to um, share how things could be done in the future um, but there are also a lot of people uh, very curious and even if sometimes uh, the incentives are not really there for for them we've seen that uh, some physicians and gynecologists are are willing to uh, partner up and to 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 be with us in that process to make sure that it's evidence based um clinically validated and that we're doing things the right way because they understand how it can improve people's life at the end of the road. Thank you. And um, I think I'll take one more question from the audience. And I thought this one um, was interesting. So the, you all need to navigate, you know, international and national guidelines and regulations uh, for your product. And have you seen instances where you were puzzled by the regulation and where you thought that this was not relevant for what you wanted to do? Um, any example of that? Or does it all make sense why, as you take a step back? For us in AI, um, this is um, such a, an interesting area because the way that AI is developed, it continually improves. And yet we still have to go through these massive regulatory processes every time we improve the model. That's not sustainable and it has to change. It will change, but we're stuck in that middle middle place. Um, and then let's see what else in terms of uh, regulation. I suppose the other thing in terms of AI is that the, the FDA breakthrough status. So starting to see those new pathways, um, I think is exciting. And I think a, a chink of light in an otherwise quite challenging space the other thing I would say is you need an amazing regulatory team, which we have, uh, because it is extremely complex. And, and every geography is different, or most geographies are different. I'll share a quick thing. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are, we are um, regulated, so we're a class two device. Um, I think the I think the way the, the areas where FDA, I think, uh, uh, and we have not spoken to the European regulatory bodies yet, but I think the way the FDA, in my opinion, is sort of um, at least in the women's health space, um, is perhaps a little bit more antiquated as I think their perspective on who gets access to information. Um, and I kind of mentioned that before. I, I think that we've definitely had conversations with them that for us just, I think we could even point to um, point to journal articles from an AJOG over the value of patients having access to information and being able to take a more active role in managing their care and they were unmoved by the professional societies. And so I think that is an area that I believe the, the regulatory bodies need to move on. I think they need to um, develop perhaps some best practices and guidelines for how to conduct usability studies in a way that's producing data that gives them confidence that what you are presenting back to, inf back to patients is understandable, is valuable, is meaningful, um, and is not creating, I think, some of the, cons uh, not triggering some of the concerns that they have which isn't necessarily an easy feat because you're actually serving obviously a pretty wide range of people with different educational backgrounds and different lived experiences. But that being said, I think it's something that is really critical for the healthcare space to evolve um, and to move from this kind of paternalistic system that we largely operate into something that's a lot more collaborative with their patients. All right. Well, so thank you. That that was all like very, very interesting. I'll um, wrap up this session. And again, thank you all for, for having been with us today. Um, just to just to conclude this panel. So I think we have seen like three very different and interesting ways to collect um, female specific data in the field of 
you know, pregnancy in the in the in the sphere of breast cancer, and just in terms of having background hormonal level measurements, and and and, and indeed, like they address like these different aspects of improving women's health, but also just deepening our understanding on how like the the pregnancies or the cycle or like other menopausal status or pubertal like affect other uh, conditions that may sh be shared by male and, and female. And, and I think there was a question that uh, touched on that, that maybe if we actually can use this kind of natural experiment of um, cycling, that would actually give us a tool to better understand the biomechanisms that are um, at role and that could ultimately benefit males as well, because uh, we would have gained a, an understanding by having those natural fluctuations. Um, so in, in terms of uh, what was the main roadblocks before you guys could come and develop uh, the products you've presented today? Um, you, we talked a lot about the culture and how it has evolved and how now is a really interesting time for female health and how investors are a lot more open to uh, fund this. There is still um, maybe this, this issue that most of these products are long-term investment. They're um, products that take a long time to, from the idea to being actually implemented and be in the hands of the end users, and um, and that maybe is still something to to deal with. And 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 maybe as a as a solution to that is to be very clear from the start who is going to be paying for the product, who is going to have access to it, who is going to order it, and and so on um and and yeah and then gaps in like there, there were some gaps in technology but really also all of your products have taken advantage of things that were developed uh overall either in in biotechnology like having uh sensors that are miniaturized and and they're like we talked about a little bit how, how the smartphones actually industry has led to those miniaturization but also how other device like glucose sensors like how it has like probably driven um, being able to detect smaller amounts of molecules in different fluids and that's how this helped and obviously for me i had the whole deep learning revolution that we're living in <laughs> has allowed to develop this um and and I hear, I heard a lot of like really good relationships with the medical world with obstetricians and, and trying to um, make sure that, uh, you know, all the patient's needs were heard and that uh, the, the obstetrician's point of view or opinions or concerns were also heard and, and put into the development of this product. So with this, I'll um, thank you very, very much. I don't